Good afternoon. I'm Sylvia Kahan, a professor of music at the City University of New York, and I'm delighted to be speaking with you today about the fourth program in the Bard Festival celebration of Nadi Boulanger. And the name of this program is The Epitome of Chic, Paris Between the Wars. Now, I personally don't think that chic quite covers what you are going to hear today. In addition to chic, you're also going to hear exploration and fun. You are also going to hear in the music of these nine composers, the whole panoply of compositional trends taking place during this fertile, fruitful, fun period between the two world, world wars. You will hear music that was influenced by Stravinsky. You will hear music by composers who died too young. And you will hear composers from members of the Groupe des Six, uh, about whom I'll speak later. So in this wonderful interwar period, the world and all of its artists were embracing with a feverish abandon this new period. I want you to think about the period that we are in now, where we are tentatively post lockdown. After this year of isolation, solitude, difficulties, illness, we are now feeling a sense of relief and wonderment that we can go out of our houses, that we can indulge in the activities of everyday life, that we can start to enjoy our life again, that we can go to concerts, that we can go to movies. There is this sense of elation that all of these things that were forbidden to us for nearly a year and a half are finally available. And that is how people felt at the end of World War I. This was a period that came to be known as les années folles, the crazy years. Paris during the 1920s was in the middle of a joyful recovery after those long years of the Great War. There was an exciting sense of endless possibilities in the air. So suddenly you had art and music spilling out of museums and salons and concert halls and into the cafes and the street fairs. Every day there was another new exhibition or spectacle or Dada manifestation. There were costume balls. There was a spirit of collaborative experimentation and innovation. And these events took place and, uh, in the factory, in the workplace. Um, there was a sense of inspiration from everyday objects and events from the commonplace. Suddenly the commonplace was elevated to something joyful. The concert halls were now competing with music halls. And in these uh, events, you had aristocrats that were rubbing shoulders with the masses. People were sating themselves with American rhythms of tango, ragtime. There were the chansons of the curvaceous popular singer, Mistanguet. This was the era of the cinema, of the circus, and the ringleader and town crier of this sophisticated vernacular was the young Jean Cocteau. Today, we would call Jean Cocteau an influencer. And he was, he embodied in his philosophy um, what one scholar has called lifestyle modernism. So since the end of the war, Jean Cocteau had taken to dining on Saturday evenings with a group of six young composers, recent conservatory graduates. And each night these six young folks would join Cocteau's large and boisterous group of companions, pianists, painters, writers, sculptors, poets, 
And on mass after dinner, this large group would repair to the clubs or the circus or mime shows. They would go to a place called the Gaia Bar where they would listen to the pianist Jean Vienner playing what was called then musique negre, meaning American blues, rags, and jazz. So Cocteau wrote an extremely influential manifesto in 1918 called The Cock and the Harlequin, in which he proposed the creation of what he called a typically French music. This manifesto led to a publication of articles on the same subject by a critic named Henri Collet, and uh, who concurrently with the performance of one of uh, Eric Satie's pieces, Socrat, gave to this group of six young composers the collective appellation by which they would become known to posterity. They were called the Groupe des Six, or just Les Six. Even though their styles didn't necessarily have anything in common, they all shared admiration for Eric Satie, who they regarded as a kind of spiritual mentor. And I will be talking about Satie in a second. So the young composers embraced the eccentricity and the simplicity of Satie's writings and music, and it became sort of an artistic beacon for them. And uh, despite the fact that they only participated in one project together, the, um, the articles by the critic Collet resulted in overnight fame for these young composers. And you're going to hear the music of three of them on the program. There was a sense that the days of big orchestras were over, at least insofar as French music was concerned. And this sense found proof positive in the compositions of Lacy's which represented a turning away from the three most important pre-war influences on French composition. The romanticism of Richard Wagner, who towered over all of French composition, the religiosity of César Franck, and the impressionism of Debussy. Now, Debussy died in 1918, and as soon as he died, there was a turn against his aesthetic of impressionism. It was felt to be a, a byproduct of Wagnerian writing. And Cocteau's cry was to just sweep it all away, to start absolutely from scratch, to embrace the new. Now, in the first piece of the program, uh, Lily Boulanger's Cortege, you can hear this spirit of insouciance this piece, as short as it is, two minutes long, is a sprightly toe tapper. We might say that this is a French version of hoedown music. Uh, Lily Boulanger was a child prodigy. It was discovered at age two that she had perfect pitch. Her parents, both of whom were musicians, encouraged Lily's musical education. Uh, Boulanger accompanied her 10-year-old sister, Nadia, to Nadia's classes at the Paris Conservatoire. And thus, at age five, she was sitting in on uh, conservatory-level music classes. She studied organ. She also sang and played piano, violin, cello, and harp. She competed uh, in 1912 for the Prix de Rome, but she collapsed from illness, so she had to withdraw. And she returned again the next year in 1913. And at the age of 19, she won the Prix de Rome with her cantata Faust et Hélène, thus becoming the first woman to win the coveted prize. Uh, her sister Nadia Boulanger gave up uh, competing for the Prix de Rome after four unsuccessful attempts. And instead, in addition to her own pedagogical activities, started um, supporting and encouraging the compositional career of her beloved sister. 
Unfortunately, Lily suffered from chronic illness, including bronchial pneumonia, um, and this ultimately led to the tuberculosis that ended Lily Boulanger's life at the age of 24. And even though she loved to travel, she was forced to stay home. She worked very hard to complete a number of pieces um, in her final illness, but finally she succumbed to her illness. And personally, I must say that this is a period where there were many, many, many great composers. We think especially of Debussy and Ravel and Faure, but then, then there's a long, long list of wonderful composers in this era, many of whose works you will hear in the course of the Bard Festival. But for me personally, Lily Boulanger is one of the greatest among many greats. And I'm so happy that, that this program is being begun, is beginning with one of her delightful pieces. We now turn to the music of Pierre Menu, another child prodigy who also died very young. Um, and full disclosure, this composer was completely unknown to me before I started doing the research for this talk. And this sonatine for string quartet is a wonderful discovery. Uh, Pierre Menu was only 23 when he died. Uh, he was taken under the wing of Nadia Boulanger when he was very young. Among Nadia Boulanger's great gifts is that she recognized genius in young people and she knew how to nurture it and how to um, develop compositional voices of very young composers without their ever sounding alike or sounding like they had come out of a class or a studio. Uh, in this sonnet team, you will hear precocious mastery. It is truly astonishing given that he was 20 years old when he wrote it. At this young age, he seems already to have found his voice and is able to manipulate his compositional tools with a breathtaking confidence and maturity. He writes with rhythmic drive, richness of harmony, agility in his use of counterpoint. And we also hear that these musical tools are deployed in the service of expressiveness, tenderness, and a sense of humanity. Uh, you will hear the influence of Debussy in this piece. Uh, Menu has a, um, a gift of uh, creating a harmonic palette that, uh, that, that is totally cohesive. And another thing that I find interesting in this piece is that he doesn't always give the main tunes to the first violinist. Very often the tune begins in the second violin and is eventually passed on to the first violin. Uh, the piece as many of the uh, compositions on this program are, are written in a neoclassical style. We now turn to uh, three interludes for soprano and piano by Georges Auric. So Auric was yet another child prodigy. Um, he had a long and productive career. He was chic. Uh, he was possessed of a brilliant intellect and was considered to be the most precocious of the groupe des six. He was a child prodigy both in piano and composition, and he was performing his compositions publicly by age 12. His compositions were first performed at the young age of 14 under the auspices of the Société Nationale de Musique, which was the premier venue for the presentation of new musical works. And these works are imbued with freshness, simplicity, sophistication, wit, and these were early models for the aesthetics of Lacis. He was a voracious reader, he knew all the poets, and his choice of texts for his early songs demonstrate a wide-ranging knowledge of, of the literature and sophisticated tastes. Today, he is best known for his film scores, and one of them includes at least one song that has become immortal, um, uh, Moulin Rouge, which was sung by Juliette Greco 
and, and achieved great fame. Um, this was from the eponymous film by John Huston. Georges Auric wrote many songs, there are about 80 of them, and his biggest successes were miniatures, like uh, the three interludes that you will hear um, on this program. Now, René Chalut, the poet, was especially known because his witty and sophisticated poems were set by many musicians. According to one inventory, 83 of his poems were put were set to music by 27 musicians, including, in addition to Auric, Mio, Roussel, Satie, Germain Taifer, all set his, um, his poems. And you will hear that even though these songs are brief, they are tongue in cheek, they are witty, they make allusion to Britishisms, there's a lot of wordplay, they are simply delightful. He himself was trained as a musician. He had trained with the uh, virtuoso pianist Ricardo Vignes, and he was also a music critic in many uh, prestigious music journals. Now we turn to Germaine Taifer, the sole woman, the sole woman in the Groupe des Six. And this is a trio for violin, cello, and piano that was written in 1917 but Taifer, who had a long life and a long career, revised the work in 1978. So what you're hearing on this program is the revised version. She too uh, showed her musical gifts very young and she started studying at the Paris Conservatoire where she met the other members of the Groupe des Six. She won many prizes. She was a virtuoso pianist. Uh, she wrote several, um, she wrote a piano concerto and a concerto uh, with flute. She was always the performer um, in her own works. Um, and she too uh, was part of this group that signaled this new age. Um, her life story reads a little bit like a soap opera. She had very unhappy marriages with celebrated men and um, the sort of bitterness that came out of her failed marital experiences found their way into a number of songs which are feminist uh, before their time. Uh, she is a marvelous composer and you know right now you know these days um, we, we are talking a lot thankfully about women composers but she's just a great composer, period. And I'm thrilled that this um, neoclassical trio is being performed. You will hear that this, there's a sort of vigor and muscularity to this writing. Um, there is a, kind of a homogeneity of texture in the way that we associate with Johannes Brahms. I would say that in this trio, her gifts for instrumentation, which are prodigious, are not as readily apparent. There is a kind of hearty um, thickness to the texture, which sets it apart from many of the other French works. It is a terrific work. It's full of rhythmic vitality, clarity of construction, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. We move on now to one of the great beloved figures of French music of the time, and there is, that is Eric Satie. So Satie is, you know, super well known for the uh, gymnopédie that is heard in commercials, in movies, it's heard all over the place. This was an early work, uh, very tonal, very simple, with a melancholy um, sort of appeal, you know, considered typically French. Um, Satie worked early on in um, cafes to make, um, to make a living. And so a lot of his early music has a sort of popular, very ironic quality to it. But at the young age of 40, Satie decided that he didn't have enough training. So he went back to school at the Schola Cantorum which was an academic institution that functioned completely apart from the state-sanctioned Paris Conservatoire. 
Um, this was an independent institution and it was founded by renowned composer Vincent Van E. And it emphasized rigorous academic models uh, such as Palestrina and Bach. It focused on the teaching of counterpoint, whereas the Paris Conservatoire focused more on the teaching of harmony. Uh, Satie studied theory and counterpoint with composer Albert Roussel, who was on the faculty. And Satie tried to make up for what he felt were deficiencies in his technical knowledge of music. He also was trying to get rid of this um, reputation of being sort of an amateur composer because of the popular quality of his music. And he graduated from the Scola in 1908 with a diploma in counterpoint. In this piece that we are going to hear, the Pasakaya, um, you hear a sort of tongue in cheek manifestation of what he learned in school. Uh, now, a Pasakalia, um, the, the uh, Italian original term, um, is a, a work that uses a repeated ground base. In other words, a, um, a repeated pattern in the bass line above which um, there is melodic variation. This piece is not a true Pasacaglia um, because there is no ground bass. Instead, Sati uses frequent repetition of the opening bars as an organiz organizational device. Um, uh, it is a tongue in cheek uh, version of a serious piece of music by someone who has studied counterpoint. I am sure you will love it. Another beloved figure in French music, Francis Poulenc, uh, of all the composers on this program, he is, is surely the best known, most performed body of work. He is, uh, he is especially well known in the domain of vocal repertoire and opera. And to quote the wonderful song scholar and collaborative pianist Graham Johnson, quote, he is the most lovable of composers, not because he is a joker, but because he is not afraid to yield to emotion, to his emotions and to follow his heart. Uh, so these three pieces are exceptional in Francis Poulenc's uh, compositional output uh, because they are extremely improvisatory. Uh, Francis Poulenc wrote lots and lots and lots of piano music, and it's not played as often. First of all, you need a very large hand. Uh, um, Poulenc had enormous hands, and you know I have small hands, so I can't play this music, unfortunately. But for virtuosos like Vladimir Horowitz, who, when he came to Paris and met Poulenc, he started using, he started incorporating Poulenc's music in a lot of his recital programs. And there are recordings of Horowitz playing um, these pieces. Uh, you will hear a sort of wild, uh, elaborate improvisation in the opening pastoral. You will then hear a hymn. Uh, Poulenc had a very uh, spiritual side. Those of you who are opera lovers surely know his uh, Dialogues of the Carmelites. He also wrote, uh, Poulenc also wrote a lot of sacred music. And you will hear this very um, unique sense of religiosity. It is not at all like the lugubrious uh, sacred music uh, of the 19th century written by famous French uh, church composers. This is a really individual approach to spirituality. This is a great cycle. Uh, I don't know who the pianist is for this program, but that person surely is a great virtuoso because you need lots of chops to play this piece well. Uh, the person for whom it was written, Ricardo Vignes, who also gave the first performance of the work, des described this piece of being, quote, of childlike facility. All right, so there is a childlike quality in the quirky counterpoint and the manic shifts of direction, 
but there's nothing childlike about the technique needed to do a successful performance. The next composer, Elsa Baren, uh, is somebody who, again, I had heard her name, but did not know her music and was delighted to become acquainted with it. She was the daughter of the principal cellist of the Opera Orchestra of Paris, and she began studying piano at a very early age. She won many prizes, uh, and she also won the Prix de Rome, making her the fourth female winner since the competition began. Um, after school, she worked at French National Radio as a pianist, a sound recorder, and the head of singing. And then she eventually became a sound mixer. She was heavily involved in the French resistance. Uh, after the war, she held the position of recording director for uh, a prestigious record label. And in 1953, she was appointed to the faculty of the Paris Conservatoire. The music of Elsa Baren uh, is very powerful. Uh, there is a strong sense of humanity um, and the human condition, the social condition. Uh, when I listen to this, I hear the same sort of quality of humanistic writing that we associate with someone like Beethoven. It is fervent, it is strong, it rouses the heart. Um, there is a keen sense of instrumental timbre and color, and you will hear that in the interplay between the horn and the piano. She uh, embraced classical forms, another neoclassicist, um, but there is a, a wonderful individual voice um, uh, in this writing, and I, I am so glad that uh, her music is record is included in this program. Uh, we now come to the founder of the feast, Nadia Boulanger, whose compositional career was overshadowed by that of her sister Lily. Uh, but Nadia Boulanger was a wonderful composer, and you will hear um, her gifts in these two songs. Now. What I find striking about the two songs that you will hear um, is not only the skill of their composition and their haunting beauty, but the fact that Nadia Boulanger chose two rather painful, gritty poems. Um, so the, um, the poet Camille Mauclair had this sort of painful, sardonic view of life. And I'm just gonna read you the first couple verses of the first um, song, Au Bord de la Nuit, At the Edge of Night. This man, and this is my translation. This man no longer wanted to live. What do you want to get involved with this for? Monsieur, Madame, in all truth, this man had had enough. His heart was like a stone, that if someone had opened it, perhaps in this heart of a lover, we could have seen the diamond within. Uh, in the second poem, uh, Le Couteau, which means the knife, again, we get this very dark imagery. So again, my translation, I have a knife in my heart, a beautiful woman planted it there. I have a knife in my heart, and cannot get it out, cannot pull it out. This knife is there for love of her, a beautiful woman planted it there. All of my heart um, went out of itself with all of my regret. So in both songs, you will hear a beautiful, sonorous, perfectly written for the voice vocal line with a gritty, dirge-like, dark, painful accompaniment. It expresses perfectly the pain of the, the poetry. And this, of course, is the mark of a great songwriter, to be able to create another parallel art form um, out of the original poetry. And uh, Nadia Boulanger has done this in a masterful way. And the final piece of the program was written by someone who was at the height of his powers, Albert Roussel, 
So Roussel was a contemporary of Debussy. Uh, he was born in 1869, lived to 1937, so he had a much longer life than Debussy. He spent seven years as a midshipman and only turned to music as an adult and became one of the most prominent French composers of the interwar period. And his music is still played frequently in France. We don't hear it so much in the United States. Um, his works were strongly influenced by the Impressionism of Debussy and Ravel. But the work we're going to hear uh, in this program is more influenced by Stravinsky and neoclassicism. Uh, by temperament, Roussel was a classicist. And in this particular work, uh, it is rather stripped down. There aren't melodies per se um, in, in much of the piece, but there is a sort of clock-like, you know, machine-like quality. And I say this in a positive way. You know, we think of um, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach often as a, you know, motoric. Uh, and in this kind of music, it works beautifully. Uh, there is a sort of tick-tock quality in the bass. Lots of sound effects, lots of beautiful instrumental colors. Um, the harp is allowed to shine. The flute has terrific um, melodic lines. Um, there is a hint of jazz and, it's, uh, and it features a kind of wrong note tonality such as we would associate often with Stravinsky and also with Serge Prokofiev. We are hearing in this piece um, an epitome of the art of neoclassicism, and we are hearing a master at the top of his game. It's a wonderful piece and a, a perfect ending to an extraordinarily varied and fascinating program. Thank you. <laughs> 